Hey everyone, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 85. 85. Not one shark has had number 85. Not a single one. We're, we're getting to that point. We're running out of people. <laughs> now, a couple more episodes, we'll have a few there. But, uh, you know, uh, guys, we said we weren't going to do a show for you, a uh, recorded show at least, unless we had, uh, you know, something going on. We've just been doing the live. So um, if there was an interview or something happened over this week. So we really haven't had anything happening this week, but... Uh, Oh, someone's at the door. What's up, boys? Oh, it's Scott Scott Hannon. Hannon. Show 85, and this is the first one I've been on? Yeah. Oh, no. Show 85. <laughs> All right, so we are back. We've got Scott Hannon with us. This is awesome. It's our, uh, our first interview of the uh, stay at home period, if you will. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Scott, how are you doing over there, bud? No, not too bad. Hang it in there, bud. So, you know, homeschooling the kids, a little hockey, a little soccer in the backyard. So, you know, hold, holding things together in, in a tough time. So it's been good. Nice. Right. Yeah, we were talking a little bit uh, off the air there about uh, the kids and homeschooling and whatnot. It's, uh, it's a little rough. You've got the Zoom calls. And your, your kids are a little bit older than, than my kids. So you said it might have been uh, – a little bit easier dealing with them because they're a little more self-sufficient, but it uh, sounds like it's uh, you know homeschooling is not going to be a secondary job for either of us. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm a good gym teacher, but I don't, I don't know. The schooling at, in the yard, I give a lot of credit to my wife. She takes care of a lot of the schooling. I get to cover recess and lunch, run them through some drills. <laughs> I can tell you one thing. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I've got a backyard right now. We've got some good weather, so I can run them through some, some drills, sprints, you know, keep them in shape. That's pretty good. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you, you would be pretty good at that because, as Aaron's about to point out, um, man, you had a pretty long career there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 1997 drafts, you were drafted along with uh, Patrick Marlowe in the first round and uh, Joe Thornton, but not by the Sharks. He was drafted by Boston originally. And Mark Smith was in that draft. He was drafted much, much later. But a little bit farther down. That's all right. All right. Here's here's Scotty right here. He had up 1,055 games. Uh, that ranks you seventh in your whole draft class, which is pretty pretty good. Uh, and Smitty, I'll, I'll come down here to Smitty. He's right down here. Uh, I, th- I forgot what he was, number 27, I think, which isn't bad for such a, a late-round pick for him. But, no, uh, kidding. no kidding. He, he ironed out quite a good career for himself. That's pretty good. That's pretty yeah. good. Um, and then go into your, uh, your, let's see, your stats here with the Sharks. Let me pull that up real quick. Uh, <laughs> nice, nice and short. Uh, let's see, we got, um, for the Sharks themselves, over here with 1,055, you had 626 games. So you had two stints for the Sharks. You played for Colorado, Washington, Calgary, as well as Nashville. And uh, boo the predators, but you know, you do what <laughs> I, was you gotta. One, I was a short one, yeah. Um, and you also had another 100 even playoff games, which is kind of cool. Did you plan that out? I did, I did exactly like that. I said, you know what, after 100, I'm like, no, that's it for me, no more. <laughs> that's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, no, that's great, great though. I locked up there like that, especially the games in my draft class. That's pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, it's Very pretty amazing. Cool. Very cool. Uh, before we actually, I want to get to a little bit about one of the guys in your draft class that Aaron actually mentioned. But before we get there, I did want to ask, um, after your career was over, you, you're still living here in San Jose. Was that because this was the last destination or was that because uh, there's something special about San Jose uh, in particular? You know what? I think it's a little bit of both. When I, If I was looking at the end of my career, I didn't know I was going to play the last two years in San Jose. I was in Nashville it was kind of a weird year. We had the lockout. It was a shortened season. Nashville, we struggled there as a team, and we were missing the playoffs. And it's, in some ways, a funny story. I was sitting there. I didn't think I was going to get traded. And then I get a call from uh, Doug Wilson saying he's going to pick me up, come in for the playoffs, and, you know, just be me. And it turns out in that playoff stretch that, you know, we had an injury. Jason Amirs went down. I came in. I played pretty well in the playoffs and ended up – getting two more years and finishing off in San Jose. And that was like, it's just like a blessing. It was sort of something that, you know, I, I'm not going to say I was going to move back. If that was the end of my career in Nashville, most likely we would have ended up in um, Colorado, back in Denver. That's where we had our house. We spent a lot of summers there. But my wife's from here. Obviously, I have a lot of ties to the community, and it just turned out perfect. I mean, now being back in the Bay Area, 
I get to do so many things. I'm, I'm working with the Sharks Alumni Foundation with Doug Murray. We've started that up. I'm, you know, getting to do some things with NBC now. So, so many things clicked and there's so many connections. Again, like I said to the hockey team, Doug Wilson's been so great. Still knowing a bunch of guys, Joe Thornton, you know, Patty Marlowe. I'm really good friends with them. You know, a lot of guys are sticking around Dan Boyle and it just turned out great. I mean, I love the fact that, you know, what, what's not to like about the Bay Area getting to serve? <laughs> I get to go up skiing up in the mountains, so I'm enjoying my life here now for sure. And you know, uh, one of the other things that you were able to do, I don't know if you're still doing it, but um, the Learn to Play program over at Solar for America, because you actually coached my son, Jace. Yeah, yeah, I've actually really enjoyed that. Now, anybody that says they're going to end their career and jump into coaching, I didn't think I was going to do it. <laughs> just I didn't know, you know, do I do that with my kids? I, I jumped on with them, and then it just kind of, I, I really enjoyed it. I I loved working with the kids. I got on with the Learn to Play program. I'm still coaching it now. Unfortunately, with everything that was going on, we were supposed to do one here at the end of March, and I was leading that up, and then we would have had one in September again. So it's unfortunate. You know, you see this ripple-down effect with the quarantine, how it affects so many different levels. Um, talking to Curtis Brown the other night, we were on a webcast with all their uh, – with a lot of their Sharks, junior Sharks teams. And I mean, the 18 U's were going to nationals and, you know, all of a sudden that's over and done with, and they're moving on after this. So it, it's sad to see it, it affecting so many things. You know, we all know what's going on in the, in the economy and people being out of work, but even with kids and school and, and junior Sharks programs, it's really unfortunate. Yeah, that's uh, it's a bummer. Um, we'll, go, we'll go a little bit more lighthearted now. I think Aaron had something he wanted to bring up. And it was something about the uh, the alumni, actually, that we just spoke about, Aaron. Uh, well, we interviewed both Douglas Murray and Mark Smith. And we asked both of them for a funny story um, that they could share that was, you know, somewhat family friendly. And uh, they happened to both have stories about you, which we thought was kind of interesting. So uh, we're yeah. going to. You haven't seen these yet, I don't think. So we're I have not seen these. Yet. I have not seen these yet. So, so we're gonna we're gonna roll back. This is from about a year ago, I think, when we interviewed them. Um, and so here here's a listen. To, here's first Mark Smith. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I can. My first year, I, I came into camp here with Scott Hannon. Uh, he was my roommate for the first time I came to town, which was, was pretty cool. And actually, I got a good, good story about that. Sure. Actually, if yeah. you guys want to hear that, yeah, let's hear it. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I wheeled in. We were staying at the Hilton at that time, so I wheeled in the hotel and uh, checked in. And I looked. I'm like, you know, who's my roommate? You know, and then checked out. I'm like, it's Scott Hannon. I'm like, he played in the West, right? And I'm mm -hmm. like, he's probably a good guy. And nice. I was like, I never met him before. So I came up to the room and I, I came in and I introduced myself. Hi, you know, Mark Smith. You know, it's, oh, cool. You know, it's, come on in. So we're sitting there and I, for some reason, I opened a drawer and I, I don't know why, because I never opened drawers in a hotel, but I, he had all his clothes folded out in the, in the things, you know, his bags unpacked. And I turn around, I'm like, what do you think you're going to be here for a while? <laughs> and then, oh, he cracked up and had a good laugh about it. But uh, yeah, ever since then, we're, we've been pretty good pals. So. Nice. <laughs> oh, well, I was a pretty confident guy, so I turned out to be okay. I got to stick around. <laughs> funny, funny story about Smitty, probably not going to like me talking about this one, is you notice how good his hair looked there, right? Now, little did you know that I played with Smitty forever. We broke in together. We played against the West. He was going bald at like 20. <laughs> wow. He, it's He should be he should be a poster child for Propecia because he went on Propecia, and that's why he's got hair because he would look like you. He that's impressive. And he's got nice spiky hair and he's so, you know, he can't be a rock star and not have the good hair. So yeah. right there, Propecia, I found that in his drawer one time. I'm like, what is this stuff? And he's like, hey, hey. <laughs> well, he got a little hair on his shoulders too, but he really got on the back. So it, it is nice. No, I mean, you know, me and Smitty, great buddies for a long, long time. Still close. They love that guy. He had a great career, great guy living in San Francisco. So, you know what I mean? Nothing but good things to say about that guy. But that's, that's a little funny little tidbit for you about uh, Smitty there. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, we wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of fire back. So uh, that's great, great chirp on the on the return there. So we've <laughs> He's also probably not going to like that one being out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've also got and, and prepare yourself uh, for the next guy, uh, Crankshaft. Actually, uh, another good uh, friend of yours. You guys had a bit of a competition, so we'll go ahead and uh, roll that clip now. 
I don't know, is it a wide angle? Uh, yeah, 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 it's, okay. yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I might have a, quite a large head. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, what happens is you have a lot of uh, time to kill when you're an athlete and uh, you come up with stupid stuff and <laughs> uh, sometimes you have a head off. And uh, I, I honestly, I only lost one head off in my career, which was to uh, McIntyre, the old six foot eight fighter in Pittsburgh. He was in the minors though, but Okay. Yeah, uh, so I lost it by like an eighth of an inch, and I couldn't <laughs> believe it was that close because his melon looked huge. So <laughs> I know what you guys are looking at, but when I first got up to the Sharks, I got called head, and uh. Hannon was called head at times, yeah. and they had to figure out, like, who has the biggest head? And <laughs> so we did the classic of measuring around, and I crushed him, and they're like, no, this can't be right. You know, Hannon has a little bit more of a long face, right? Okay. So. We had to go with the displacement theory. So uh, in the training room, we filled the water with a bucket of water, a bucket with water, and uh, you know we pushed our heads down and saw who displaced the most water. And sadly, I won that one too. Or... No, it's funny. Oh that, it's funny that that was Hannon because last week Mark Smith had a, had some good Hannon chirps. Uh, yeah, he was his roommate. Well, Hannon chirped us enough when we played, yeah. so we got to give it back. So yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, if we ever have Hannon on the show here, he'll, he'll be able to fire back at yeah. you guys. But for now, you're, you're 2 0 against him right now. So, yeah. oh, excellent. You and Smitty, well done. <laughs> He's right. Look at that head, though, man. Honestly, you throw there on that thing. That's the only thing you can jerk you about. The size of that melon. But that there goes to show you how much free time we did have as hockey players where we would do stupid stuff. Like, I think Jumbo was in on it, too. Jumbo's like, no, let's have our head off. Come on. <laughs> Those heads in a pail of water. We're like, well, hey, why not for the team, right? For the boys. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, uh, this is the you know what? That's the stuff you miss when you don't play anymore. It's just that <laughs> that no nonsense chirping guys all the time and like doing just stupid stuff in hotels, dressing rooms. It was it was classic. Dougie's great guy again, but does have a large melon. So I, I like, though, that he said, you know, I crushed him at, with the circumference, but, you know, Hannon's got, uh, got a longer head instead. Yeah, so. I've, got more, I've got more of a forehead than he does. You know? <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's just the size of his makes his forehead look so small, but really it's big. It's big. He seems like he was he was both sad and happy that he won. Yeah, he, he, he was happy. He was happy. He was happy. <laughs> oh, my God. Too oh, funny, man. Too funny. Yeah, no, you, that's – that's crazy, you know the 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 camaraderie and whatnot. That uh, I mean, how how much of that do you really miss? I mean, I know you've got you got Brody kind of that you hang out with now with NBC, but um, it's nowhere near you know like you know the the days where you're playing with these guys and the, the stuff that goes on in the locker room like that. I mean, uh, how yeah. much of that do you I mean, miss? I mean, Brody Brody tries Brody tries hard, but he does <laughs> not have it. Like you know, no, it, that that is the things you miss. You live you live and you breathe like Smitty. Like we we were roommates from day one. And got along as best buddies. And then, you know, back in the day, even it's a little bit different now, I would say, because like back in the day, you had roommates. Like I, I had roommates, Josh Georges, Brad Stewart, and you literally, literally live with these guys. You knew them better than your wives. Like you would be sitting in there, you go to dinner every night together. You'd be back in the room. What movies are you going to watch? Who has control of the TV controller? What guy? And Jumbo could never be alone. So Jumbo's calling over. He would always have a shared room with like me and Josh Georges. And we, He'd come over in our room, kick Georgie on the floor. So we'd have Georgie on the floor, me and Jumbo in the beds, and we'd watch TVs. And it was just, it was priceless. We'd play cards, we'd play video games, we'd just do anything. Like it was just, those are things when you you, you look back on it. It's it, and everybody always says it, but that's the stuff you kind of miss because that type of thing is not available really anywhere else. When you retire, it's like you know you go around and if you start chirping the the guy at the soccer field who's your dad's coach, they look at you like. Did you just say that to me? You're like, oh yeah, I'm not in the locker room anymore. I can't. Wow, well, it's good. Nice. So. There's a period of adjustment then. Yeah, a little nice. bit, a little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think Aaron was going to ask about uh, a different topic here. Go ahead, Aaron. Sure. Like, uh, probably one of the most famous things, and we actually had Smitty talk about this too, was the five on three versus Edmonton. In I believe it was the playoffs too. Um, that was I was at that game, and I think that was. The loudest I'd heard the arena up in, at that point. I don't think I've heard it even. Uh, well, I wasn't at the game seven against Vegas. So that was pretty loud. Paul was there, but um, that was the loudest I at that point. That I heard. I that one too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, could you take us through that five on three? Do you remember much of it? I'm, I'm sure you do. 
Yeah, you know, it was just kind of a whirlwind. You know, we, you know, it was kind of chaotic, and you go back and watch it again. And I remember just flopping around, toss, making so many great saves, and, and everybody seemed to contribute in that in some way. You know, if it wasn't a block shot, you're flopping around, and you know, that Edmonton was moving it around, and you know, I just felt like toss stood on his head. We were able to get that puck out at the end with a block shot, and the eruption of the crowd, like that was something that I remember it was just deafening. Your ears like hurt when it was on, when you were on the ice. And that rarely happens. I think I can count on my hand a couple times, maybe, but nothing that loud. And, and the rush you felt, cause you know, in the playoffs, that was big. When you get things like that and you, that building and that energy that you get, and you really think you can take it on. Of course, Edmonton came back and, and, and scored right, sort of right after that. But again, it was, it was a rush. It was a, a great feeling and that and that's what playoff hockey is about that's the stuff you know again i keep saying this like it's when you retire that you miss it's that competitiveness and that that, that feeling you got and it tend to happen a lot in the playoffs now the you guys feed off of the crowd obviously but is the san jose arena louder than most other places that you've played at yeah uh, for sure and being a, 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 like on a home ice seeing it day in and day out it was the, i don't know if it was the acoustics in there the fans the way they could really get into it that excitement but there was some playoff rounds i remember early on when we beat st louis in the first round and we won it at home and it was the same thing it was just deafening you're on the ice and man you almost needed earplugs and it was you know and, and i and i witnessed that as a fan too because i was at that game seven against uh vegas when we won it and that it just kept building and building and building and when that's like the win at the end it was just it was it's incredible and you and you love to see that and the impact you know as a player the impact you can have on fans and on people and on yourselves as far as getting a city behind you know obviously we always wish and we keep saying it, that we, we could bring the cup back here and it'll happen it'll happen with this with this team but and, and to see that but that the crowd it's been you know, amazing to play in front of as a, as a player, and it's been great as a fan as well uh, these last few years. Nice. Uh, all right, let's take a little detour here, and let's talk about this season, What, assuming that it's still going to happen. Do you think it'll happen? Do you think there's a chance that they could play the rest of the season and or the playoffs into the Stanley Cup this season? Realistically, if, I, if I'm a – to hope, yeah, I, I would, I would hope that they could, but realistically, I don't think it's gonna be possible. I don't think unless some something happens, a, a miracle happens as far as like a treatment. I don't see how they get to play this season out. It's just with you know testing and and if somebody comes down the quarantining, I'm not so sure. From what I've heard and what I could see, I'm not so sure that could happen this year, which is really unfortunate. But you know, again, and hopefully next year we can we can start the season but again it's up in the air right now and i'm not in the end i'm not in the no but it, it looks to me from my my perspective that it would be pretty tough to start yeah because yeah, it sounded like heard. uh they were they were saying that they would have to do something like almost like an olympic village right um where you've got all these players that are uh, constantly being tested and you know the the officials and whoever else they're basically living in a in a bubble in their own little ecosystem away from families and for everyone else, and I know a lot of the testing, the testing isn't readily available right now for everyone. So that kind of means that those folks who'd have like kind of first priority over all that testing, that's kind of a slippery slope too. So yeah, I'm kind of with you on this one. I just don't see how they could continue it. And one of the points I made last week was, you know, even if they do continue it, it's not even going to feel like this season. By the time they're around to it, we heard Santa Clara County, they don't want any sporting events till what, November? So um, I mean, that's into next season already. So I just, I don't see how uh, we could possibly move forward with the current season uh, and still have things kind of feel even somewhat normal. Right. And I feel like what, what if one person got sick? We know what happens right now. Like, so say after all that quarantining, everybody's safety, it does happen. One person gets sick. Well, you have to quarantine that whole team now for 14 days. So yep. does that team just lose the playoffs? Do you call up the whole minor league team? Like it, it just, it doesn't, it, that's where the thing happens. It sounds great in theory where you test everybody and nobody would get sick and you'd wash everything. But I think, you know, the reality of it is it's too risky. Yeah. I, it, to me, I, I don't even know if next season is going to start on time because they're talking about I mean, we live in Santa Clara County for those people who are watching that aren't around here. They're saying not until Thanksgiving, uh, no sporting events until at least after Thanksgiving. 
So theoretically, they could start the season. And I believe Gary Bettman last week talked about this, where he was saying there's certain parts of the country or in Canada where they will be cleared to play, but in other parts they won't be. And so then how do you handle that situation? Um, and then traveling back and forth between Canada and the United States, there's going to be visa problems. And because uh, I think there's an international travel ban for certain stuff. So it, it's just kind of tricky. And, and next season, I think, is even going to be not starting on time. Yeah, and then and then the fine line you dance between what's a, a necessity and what's not. Like, why would we get special treatment over somebody that's you know out of a job right now? I I don't know. It's it's a touchy subject, and I see how it would would happen across so many things. But so many things would have to go right. But again, I have faith in you know the science community. I mean, we just heard on the news today that Gilead. I know it's early that might have a treatment and things like that. And I'm hoping that something along those lines can come out where we find a good treatment. We have testing, maybe some contact tracing that really steps up people's confidence and the way they can track and trace this, this thing. But I mean, who knows? I have faith in that. And who knows, but barring that a miracle and hopefully we can get something started so we can start hearing the, the, the shark tank cheer like they did last, you know, for game seven of the, against the golden Knights, you know, that would be awesome. Absolutely. Certainly hope so. So uh, if, if this season is, you know, gone, essentially affected by this, this whole outbreak and whatnot, at least can we look back at something that was maybe positive about this season? I know the Sharks, uh, they didn't really live up to what they had on paper. I felt there was a lot of really big names and a lot of uh, potential there. Um, it just did not come together for one reason or another. Maybe kind of your assessment on maybe why that was the case and if there were certain bright spots that we can look forward to for next season. You know, I think it's such a fine line between winning and losing in hockey. And we like to talk. And, I mean, I know me being a, on NBC, you start to look at it as like, oh, that's the reason why. But it's it's funny. Sometimes things just snowball and they don't click right and they don't work. And that can be a goal here or a goal there. I know we want to talk about losing certain players in the uh, on the team and then the bonding and, you know, the room. And But really what I think is just things kind of didn't work out the way they did. There was some – guys coming back off injuries that, you know, are, are tough and they didn't have the years they wanted to have. And that's for sure, you know, and I'm sure they're feeling the same way, but that's how things can snowball. This league is really, when they talk about parity, any team can really beat any team. And you see teams go on hot streaks. You look at what St. Louis did last year, right? Like they were at the bottom and that just shows you how close it is and what a fine line. And it's about confidence, about guys having good years. And that's why I think you look at the guys on paper, the, the numbers and the goals they can score. I have faith in guys like Doug Wilson who can put together a few pieces and, you know, we can be on the thing. I like some the way some of the young guys played. I really liked the way that the the lineup filled out with the additions of like Nason and, and those guys. I thought that solidified our bottom six, which again helps the top six play better when you can start to have – momentum and I like the ways you know that those bottom six played at Shellman. Mason I thought added a lot. They're smart hockey players. I think they're only going to get better. Ferrero was a bright spot on the blue line as far as his capabilities and to see who you know him grow as a player. You know we always never like to see guys like Dilly go because they're just solid guys. But you know in some ways it happened with me leaving and Vlasic stepping up and, and things like that. You know, that's just the way it happens. And Ferrero, to see him take that next step there after Dilly left, because he got given those minutes. And I think that's a guy that they're going to count on to play with guys like Bernsey or with Carlson and to be able to relieve some of that pressure. He's a great skater, seems to read the play better. I'd love to see where he's going to go in his his career path. And, you know, like I keep going back to those, those forwards up top, I really thought the bottom six solidified itself near the end. I didn't think we, you know, we were, we were playing a lot better as a team. Whereas sometimes at the beginning of the year, you saw it was kind of just messy, you know, and then you started seeing us play better, but it was too late. And then all of a sudden it was so much talk about not being in the playoffs, not that, and that eats away at you. So I think that that moving forward for next year, those are some bright spots. I love the way the goalies were playing at the end, but again, a lot of blame got put on them. And I don't think that that was justified. It was when you when your team is playing really well in front of you as a solid four lines, six defensemen, it's amazing how good your goalies can start to look because they're not giving the high quality shots and things like that. Like it, it really snowballs in a positive direction too. 
Yeah, yeah see, I and I know where Paul's going with this. It, yeah, you know exactly what I'm about to say, right? So, and I've been saying this pretty much all season long is, you know, how much of this is the defensive play, not just the defenseman. And um, I mean, obviously, you being a defenseman, you can speak to that, but the defensive play of the team as a whole in front of that goaltender, right? I don't care what goaltender you have. If you're not playing well defensively, you're going to get bombarded with shots, high danger chances, and you can't expect a guy to pull a Dominic Hashik every single save, right? So, for me, it was more a problem of the team's defensive play. And I thought when Bob Bugner stepped in, he really emphasized we need to play better in front of our own net, uh, have better defensive hockey. And I feel like that's probably the reason why I think he's going to be able to come back next season, uh, take the interim uh, title off of that head coaching job. I think he's going to get a shot. So uh, I'm looking forward to that personally because, again, I think he did a great job of – identifying what the actual problem was, which was a team defense problem, not let's ship Martin Jones out and try to bring someone else back in. Uh, as, a, as a former defenseman in the professional level, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Bob did a great job. I, I really do. I really like him as a coach. I think he responds. He sees that. And that's not to take anything away from Pete. Pete was a great guy. And, and sometimes we get caught in this. as like coaches have a shelf life <laughs> in some ways. It's just the way it goes. It's like me. We were talking about our kids earlier. The one thing I keep saying is, like, I, I send my kids off to my friend's house, and they're like, wow, your kid is so well-behaved. He just listens to me all the time. He comes, I'm like, what kid are you talking about? Because they're all listening to dad, right? So it's just that way. Like, he can only hear me so much. And I think that that's sometimes you need a fresh voice. Now, we go back to team defense, and I think it's different. I think this is what's so exciting about the game now is so many players can shoot, so many players can score. Back when I played early in my career – there was a couple couple top scorers, and you shut them down. It was more defense first, and you really have to shut it down as a team. And I think the Sharks got away from that at the beginning, right or wrong. I think some players thought they had to do too much. They almost cared too much. So they try, and when you start playing outside of that, when you think it's on you to win that game or on you to win it defensively or on you to win it offensively, things fall apart because you stop playing as a team. And I think the team just got back to that more towards the end of the year. And I, re- I like the way they were playing at the end of the year a lot better than I did at the beginning. Yeah, see, and and that's – sorry, I, I'll let you talk in a second. That's exactly why I like having the four player on the show because we get that, you know, not from an analytics standpoint, but from somebody who's actually played the game um, to kind of give us that insight. For So uh, thank you for that. Aaron, go ahead, fire away. So assuming that Bugner does stay as a coach and we have – uh, more or less the same pieces. Do you think this team puts it together next year and is a contender next year? I do. I think if we we play the same way that we did at the end of the year and the young guys grow even more, they're going to get given more minutes, um, and the guys come back and ha- have better years. Everybody goes through those times. You know, I, I you know, we first to say we want your top end players to play. They you need them to play. We need them to score goals. We need them to play. You know, tight. We need them to be our best players. But I think that that confidence from the bottom six being able to fill into their roles, which will allow, I think, our goaltenders will have bounce back years if they play just like they did at the end of the year, right? Throw out the bad stuff, you know, and everybody forget. Come back with confidence. Yes, I think this team can do it. I think they have the potential, the skill, and and everything to step back in and have a good, solid year next year. Do you think there's uh, any pieces that need to get added this year during the offseason? Hey, there's always, it's, it's always what's available, right? Like, especially now it's so hard with cap structures and, and what it is. And I, you know, I'm not a numbers guy. I don't know all the situations, but yes, if you can add a piece that's going to add something, you know, kind of like what we did with Nason this year, like nobody really knew, but there's a perfect piece you lose. And when you lose guys, like, you know, sometimes over the course of the year, when you don't really look at, it, you look at guys like, uh, that you, you you lose Don Scoy, losing guys like that. I mean, you know, some people said he had a struggle year, but those are skilled guys that you fill in that can go to other teams and get more minutes and provide more points. And on your team, you think they're struggling, whereas they just add depth. And that's something that when you can slot those guys up and down the lineup, that that's key. That is very key. And they're not, it doesn't mean because they're not putting the puck in the net that they're struggling. It's that they're just, you know, a lot of points come on power plays. A lot of points come in certain situations at the end of games or whenever. And those guys are just key parts. When you you can add more of those key parts, and it's tough. Because in a salary crop structure, a guy has a good year, and you, you move up the salary structure, all of a sudden you can't pay him. So you need young guys to step up. Guys like Nason, Shellman, really smart. You, you hear about this all the time, like smart players. 
where I noticed it right away with a guy like Shelman, where he's always on top of the puck. He was very on the defensive side, able to attack the way he used his stick. You really like those things, and it, and it it showed. He got getting better and better, and he was making some pretty high end skilled plays. I really like his intelligence on the ice. Yeah, I, th- I think you nailed it there with the they say in the bottom six, specifically that fourth line, Nason, Shelman, and uh, Melker Carlson. I thought they did a really good job. I thought they were actually pinning. Uh, teams in their zone for for quite a few shifts uh, when they were out there and it's not like they were putting the puck in the net necessarily but uh, I mean the, sh- the generation was there the pressure was there that's one of the things I love seeing from the Sharks is pressure pressure pressures a lot of times I feel like we're kind of flat-footed uh, and when they're actually going after teams uh, and they're, they're putting that hard pressure on it forces them into mistakes so that fourth line I felt uh, really played a, a big role as you're as you're saying right now as well so um, kind of validating thank you for that but um yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a couple guys that I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more out of. I think, you know, a Timo Meyer, a Kevin LeBanc, uh, they had great seasons last season. Uh, this season, it seems like they were a little bit slower uh, to the point generation than uh, anybody else would have liked. So uh, kind of your thoughts maybe on, on them, like, is this a kind of a mental hurdle that they need to get over? Um, obviously, it's not like an age thing because they're not old enough to regress, but um, kind of your thoughts on those two players. It's funny that you said mental hurdle because I go back to a guy like Hurdle. When he was 19, he comes in and he's played. He's like, it's a learning process. You really don't understand that as a young guy. You come in and it's unexpected. It's easy because, you know, I'm just scoring goals and nobody really had much expectation of me. And expectation carries with it a lot of weight. And when you lose a guy, when you lose depth, you lose guys like Pabs, you know, you know, Patty. And what that does is it focuses it on you. Okay, this guy got 20 goals and you move him up the lineup. Now all of a sudden you're playing against harder defensive players, harder lines. You're not slotted in into these easy spots. Now that's a learning curve. I, I And I, I think Timo can get there. And then guys like that, Kevin LeBanc, they can get there. But it's, it's work. And I learned that. I wish I knew what I knew now back in the day because it is. It's really about work away from the ice. You study it. You, you work on your hands. You're getting stronger. You're getting faster. You're working out constantly. You're out there early. I thought, you know, Pavelski, one of the best reasons why he was such a great leader is, like, he was the first guy on the ice. You see the way he works on his tips and he works on it. it, it to be that good and to be consistent takes a lot of work. And that consistency pays off. And sometimes as young guys, that's hard to learn. You look at Hurdle, what he does now and how dominant he was, everybody thought he was struggling. I know he had some knee injuries and stuff, but I think that's just growth as a player. And then now you see what he can do. And when he's on his game, you know, there are stretches there where he's the reason why you're winning. And when you love it, when you see players like that, and that's the capability and that's the learning curve as young guys. That's We talked about that a lot on the show about the difference between basically a, um, an everyday player and an all-star player is the consistency. The skill level is pretty much there across the board. I mean, there's you know there's outliers of the super skilled players, but most people can can play. It's the consistency that makes the difference between a superstar, all-star, regular day player kind of guys. Yeah, because again, it's scoring is oftentimes streaky. I mean, nobody can, can, like you said, like the skill level when you get a guy that can consistently put the puck in the back of the net, the Connor McDavid's or whatever you want, you know, all those guys, those are special elite players. But, you know, I go back and I constantly say this about intelligence. And that's what I really liked about the fourth line with Shellman and Nason. These guys, like you always wonder why, why is this guy up? Why is this guy down into the minors? And really it's defensive stability where, When you're not taking overt chances, when you're on top of the puck all the time in the offensive zone, where you're not taking unnecessary chances, a good stick, you're breaking things up. And that usually leads to being able to be put in situations where your ability to score, and then it becomes work. And a lot of that, you look at like Pavelski, you always talk about where does most goals get scored. How many pretty goals did that guy score? And everybody's (laughs) saying, you know, like, how is he getting 40 every year? I, he can't He can't do that again. But because he could tip the puck, he gets to the grinded areas, those those greasy spots. He scores goals that ever that it, you can't do that again. But then he just found ways. And he was a smart, smart player that worked the best. I thought he was one of the best at, you know, working at his game. How was it uh, in Washington playing with Ovechkin? What was it like being around him? Uh, amazing. He, he, You know what? He was. He's such a – 
a huge character, such a huge personality, loved the game, such a physical specimen. And I've in a, a you know part of this whole learning curve was a huge thing there. There was a young team and they had Backstrom and Mike Green and Ovechkin and they were scoring like crazy. The offense they were putting up. Um, and everybody's like, you know, when are they going to win or are they ever going to win? Because they could never get past those certain areas, you know, in the playoffs, they could get over the hump. And that's a learning curve and that's learning how to play. And you see the way Ovechkin plays now where it's a lit. I mean, he's still pumping the puck in the net. It's unbelievable at the rate he's still scoring. Mm -hmm. But I think he's taking less chances. If you, if you, when I, when we were there, and I think it was part and parcel because Washington struggled for so long. And then they get a guy like Ovechkin and like, hey, go score four goals and, you know, pack the stands. And the, the owner loved it. And then, But the problem was is they were scoring five goals against, so you'd lose 5-4. I think they learned how to win. They grew as a team. They grew as players. And, you know, I, I credit to them. They're a dominant team with, and great guys, great guys, great personalities. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun playing there. I wish I could have gone back for a, a few more years, but that's just the way it goes in hockey sometimes. Yeah, so Dylan was in good hands when he got traded. I know. He was. He was. And what a great guy for them to have, too. I mean, Dilly, my uh, hometown Surrey boy there, too, from back in my hometown. Such a, a great guy. Uh, you know, such a bummer that he went, ended up going to some place like that with a great run in store, and then this happened. So Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, I want to get your thoughts on that, too, with uh, with teams that had to unload uh, their, their prospects or their picks to get a rental player for the playoffs. Um, and now it's it could be all over, right, without ever having a, a stab at the, the Stanley Cup. So um, your, your thoughts on that with, with regard to uh, maybe a compensation for the teams that, that had to give up assets that are now not going to be able to play, potentially? I don't even know how you would do that. <laughs> honest, like, I mean, I would love to have all the answers of that, but, I mean, like, what's the other team going to say? Well, hey, that's a trade, right? That, who right. Knows? trade would have worked out right we don't know we is the guy gonna sign back i'd love to have the magic answers to be able to say like i, I wish we could just play it but i mean it's such a yeah it's such a kind of who knows i don't know yeah. <laughs> do you think uh patrick marlowe and joe thornton are coming back next year my heart says yes i hope so i hope so that no, was that I, that I, <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. I mean, I'd love to see him back. I know I think I, they got many more years in the tank, and it obviously, and I say that as gas and also in the tank. So, I mean, it would be great to see Patty. You know, hopefully we get to play next year and see him run up that game's played list. And it's always good to see Jumbo on a team, and you want to see those type of players get a chance, get a long run, get them a cup. I mean, it would be just so sad looking back on it and – you don't want to see that hanging over one of their heads because they had such great Hall of Fame careers that, you know, they deserve to win one and you hope they get a chance. For sure. Hey, uh, I want to give you an opportunity real quick. We had a couple guys trip you. You got to trip them back. Is there anybody that you want to take a stab at uh, and then maybe we can get them on the show? I don't know. Take a stab at? Wow. I, I, I had to think <laughs> about it. I have my chirps for Smitty and, and Cranky, but who else should I get? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm into the – the chirp, but I, I got a funny story for you for the fans. How about that? Perfect. Okay, sounds good. Great. I'll give a funny story because everybody likes to hear these, and it's pretty PC. So, um, it's about a rookie party we had in in uh, Boston one year, and so rookie parties are always fun. You always hear all this 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 talk about it. So we had a rookie party, and I might have had a few beers at the dinner. And it was in Boston. If you ever been on a road, like sometimes you're on a ten game road trip. We had a couple of days off, and we were in Boston. And I'm like, okay, time to go back to the hotel. And hopped in a cab, and I come up to the hotel. Yeah, take me to the Marriott in the cab. And the cab's like, yeah, sure. And we go into the Marriott, and I'm not even really paying attention. I pay the cabbie. Yeah, I I walk in, and funny thing to be known about me is like I have like is well with my big forehead. I also get cut pretty easy. So I'm, I'm walking through the door. I'm looking at my phone, and I pull the door, and I whack my head on the door. And I'm like, so I'm, I'm looking, and I'm like kind of bleeding. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, seriously, Scott? So I walk into the hotel. I go up to the elevators. I punch the elevator, and I get up to the 10th floor where my room is. And as my door opens, I'm like, I look, and there's the EMTs, and there's cops and everybody in there. And I'm like, what is going on? And then they're like, they're like, Hey, sir, how, how are you doing? 
what's wrong with your head? Because I was bleeding, right? And I'm like, wait, this isn't my hotel. And I'm like, no, this isn't my hotel. And they're like, wait, you don't, this isn't your hotel? Well, how did you hit your head? I'm like, no, I just bumped it downstairs. Well, why are you bleeding? Are you okay? You don't know what hotel you're in? You have a concussion? You've got to come with me, sir. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, you don't understand. I'm at the wrong hotel. There must be another Marriott in this city. Now, if you know Boston, they have like three Marriotts. Yep. Like, you could go to this wrong one. So I'm coming down, and the cop's like, no, you have to come with me to the hospital. We have to check you out. You have a head injury. I'm like, no, I, I, you guys don't understand. So I'm coming down the lobby, and I come out, and in walks Scott Thornton and Rob Davidson from the rookie party. So they're coming into the wrong hotel, too, and they're like, Hannah, what's wrong with you? I'm like, sorry, I don't know, man. I, I, I bumped my head a little bit. They're saying I can't go. They have to take me and check me out. So like, no, no way. So they're coming with me. So they hop into the cab. We all get into the back of an ambulance and we go to the hospital. So I'm <laughs> in the hospital and I get to see a doctor and the doctor's like, so, you know, we have to give you like a concussion protocol. And I'm like, well, okay. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. And they're like, what city are you, city are you in? And I'm like, we're in Chicago. And Scott Thornton's beside me going, damn, we're in Boston right now. I'm like, oh, sh no, we were in Chicago two days ago. The cops like, oh, okay, we're going to ask you a different question. What day of the week? And Rob Davison's beside us. He goes, oh, man, nobody knows what day of the week it is. And I'm like, and Scott Thornton buries his head. He goes, you guys aren't helping at all here. Well, finally, the, the, the doc's like asked me a couple, he's like, fed up. He's like, we couldn't answer any of the questions. I'm like, no, you don't know hockey players. We don't know anything. We just get told we have practice the next day. We play. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what time it is. Like, whatever. So finally, we get to go back to the hotel, and Thornton's like, oh, guys, seriously, this is this is insane. And my, you should have seen the cut on my head. It was like a little mini scratch. Like, it was unbelievable. So we get back to the Marriott. It's like 2 in the morning by now because we just spent an hour and a half at the ambulance. So we get to come in, and we told the boys the story the next day. So that's just some of the fun stuff that happens on the road. You're out there for a rookie party, so uh, it was it was a good story. Everybody gets a good kick out of that one. Awesome. That's, awesome. Oh, that's so good. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, usually when we have um, a guest on the show, we'll, we'll ask them, you know, for like a story time. Um, and and that, that was perfect. That's ex exactly what we're looking for. So uh, <laughs> nice stuff. Awesome. Aaron, you got anything else for uh, for Hannah here? No, I think I think no? we're good. We're all good. OK, cool. Hey, huh? Scott, again, dude, thanks for, for popping in and for uh, kind of dealing. We had some technical difficulties. Scott was uh, was very awesome to kind of. Uh, deal through some of those <laughs> you even had to download chrome you're uh, you're an expert now huh i'm an expert now i got oh, chrome yeah. you know, it's all good <laughs> okay anybody needs some chrome help he's on instagram go ahead hit him up okay <laughs> <laughs> there we go thanks guys. yeah right. awesome hey thanks again you know we have a, a little plaque that we have everybody on the show signed so we're gonna have to meet up with you and get you to uh to put your name on that one there no it sounds great sounds good. It's all settled, awesome all squared away <laughs> <laughs> cool this was uh episode 85 uh nice awesome interview again thank you scott hannon for popping on the show yeah, so thanks. uh and super producer jason thank you for facilitating this entire thing i know it's it's been weird guys we haven't uh, to do these these live type format shows these uh, remote ones but obviously you guys understand so thank you all for tuning in uh for super producer jason i'm paul i'm aaron and that's scott hannon <laughs> we'll see you guys all right, see you guys <laughs> next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at The Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at thefinfactor.com where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.